the idea of relocating to, to LA in order to do films that would make me rich, but not necessarily feed my soul, just felt like the wrong decision for me. Film director Debbie Isaac could have gone to Hollywood to ply her trade. Instead, she stayed in the Midlands and makes internationally acclaimed films at her house in the city she is proud to call home. Coventry is my home and it has my heart. This is Made in the Midlands, an original commission by the Coventry UK City of Culture, hosted by Adrian Goldberg. This is a podcast in search of an identity. An identity for the 10 million people who live in the middle of England. An identity which often goes ignored even by the people who share it. By talking to successful Midlanders like Debbie Isaac, we hope to expose the characteristics which unite that huge region which is neither north nor south. Episode 5. Debbie set up a theatre company in Coventry after studying drama in the city. She is now best known as the creator of the Nativity film franchise, which is filmed and made in the Midlands. This episode was recorded at an event at the Coventry UK City of Culture. Debbie, hello. How are you doing? You're right. Thanks, Adrian. Yes. Born in 1966 in Birmingham, you were literally made in the Midlands, weren't you? I was, and it was the year that England won the World Cup. So good things were happening in 1966. <laughs> You've lived in the Midlands, in the West Midlands, all your life. Would you say that you have a, a conscious Midlands identity? Yeah, I mean, I would say that. I'm a Midlander, I'm a Brummie, I'm a Coventrian, um, but I'm also a European, and I was going to be an American almost at one point. <laughs> so I kind of feel like I am made in the Midlands for sure, but we're all human beings, aren't we? We're all <laughs> from the same planet. Yeah, I'm just intrigued, though, about what a Midlands identity is, what you think that the Midlands brings to you. Well, I think the first word that always springs to mind is the word real. And I mean, people use it a lot. But for me, I think it is a sort of authenticity that the people of the Midlands just have and can't hide, much as sometimes we'd perhaps even like to hide it. I think we speak as we find um, we're straightforward, we have funny accents. Perhaps it makes us sound more forthright than we are, I don't know. But I like to think that we are honest, hardworking, people that just get on with life, get on with things, make things out of nothing, and love to moan. <laughs> Tell me about your beginnings then. You grew up in a, a council maisonette in Birmingham. Well, that was the start for me, yeah, and I remember it really well because it was um, a tiny little masonette in uh, Smethwick uh, on the cusp of Edgbaston. We were upstairs and there was a masonette downstairs and I remember my mum always telling us to shush because she was very conscious that the family downstairs would hear everything we were doing and she had three kids under five. We grew up quite frugally. We, we had our baths in the washing up bowl in front of the fire that kind of thing. But I think when I was about seven, we, we left that house because my dad became a tool maker and um, was earning quite good money at the factory. And they found a nice bigger house um, that was see us through the rest of our lives. And my mum's still there now. It's interesting just reflecting on the Nativity franchise and the first Nativity movie, St. Bernadette's, the working class school taking on the private school, Oakmore. Do you think that those beginnings are playing into the work that you do and have done over the years? Yeah, I grew up with stories from my mum and dad, stories about them having nothing, absolutely nothing, not running water, you know, outside toilet, being rough and ready, but being happy, being clean, being proud. But I think that sort of tension between knowing that your roots are very poor, like my mother's 
grandmother was in the workhouse in Birmingham and was rescued by Cardinal Newman, and she's very wow. proud of that, wow. and being Catholic family. However, my parents were also quite aspirational, and I think had we been richer or smarter, they may well have wanted to send us to private schools. And some of my friends went on to those kind of schools. There's a little bit of chippiness there, but I've always personally identified more with working class roots than with the aspirational side of all of that education. And I'm very passionate about state education and absolutely believe it's the best education. And I've heard that even from the horse's mouth, people who, who work in private education say, actually the, all of the best teachers are in state education because they're the ones who have to find innovative ways to deal with challenging children. So they are the best at their jobs and they're vocational and they're passionate and they don't just do it for a quiet life and, and quiet classrooms. <laughs> they deal with everything, so yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell me a bit about your mum? She sounds a very strong and forceful character. There's a, there's a great story, isn't there, about the the school play and oh, playing yes. Mary. The tell me about <laughs> the three Marys. Well, the three sisters. We went to Catholic primary school, so the school nativity was huge on the annual calendar and every child wanted to be Mary, every girl, maybe some of the boys too, but I definitely did. And my sister had been Mary before me, but she had got sick just before the performance was starting. And so they'd given the part to her best friend, Louise. And my mum was like, there's no way Louise is getting that part. And so she was up at school and she said, she's better. Jackie's better, she's ready to go on. And, you know, whatever she said to them, my sister went on that night, <laughs> not Louise. And then the next year it was my turn to audition. And I just think they were so terrified of her that they gave me the part. Actually, they gave my little sister the part the next year. Imagine what all those other kids must have felt like <laughs> in their families. But we were the three Marys. And actually it, it was a disappointing role because I didn't really like standing there with the baby. I wanted a better part, really, and I thought there were better parts on offer, and I suppose that was the beginning of something for me. <laughs> you wanted a better part than Mary in the school nativity. Uh, yeah, I, I'm just thinking about the impact of your mom on you growing up. I, I saw a lovely quote from you once saying that opportunity rarely comes knocking. I go knocking with my hobnail boots. And my high heels very <laughs> often, too. Yeah, I think that's it you create your own opportunities and you you do need a little bit of luck of course but it's what you do with the luck that really matters and as a writer obviously I can't be just a playwright or a film writer I have to write my life and that's what I do. From very early on it's clear that you had an eye for theatrical production. Yes, when I staged my first play, I was nine. And, <clears throat> and that's because all of my family worked at the Birmingham Rep as usherettes in front of house. So I was able, as a nine-year-old, to watch all the plays for free, sitting on the steps. And I was able to watch them over and over and over again. And there was one year, that year when I was nine, when the Birmingham Rep put on The Wizard of Oz as their big Christmas show. And I watched it probably 17 times. And I obviously projected myself as Dorothy, much better part than Mary. Um, and she was singing and she was dancing and she had the shoes and the dog. I mean, and it was amazing, you know, and I loved her journey as well. The whole idea of gathering her friends and going on a yellow brick road and a magical world. And I was literally carried away by this show. And I just thought, I want to do that. How am I going to do that? So I went to school and I said to my cousins, because we all went to school together because we were one big family, you know, you, Joanne, you're going to be the lion. Lisa, you're the scarecrow. I got my little sister to be the tin man. And then I got some friends to be the other characters. And I said to them, I'm really sorry, but I'm Dorothy. And I knew the script more or less in my memory because I'd watched it so many times. So I basically shared the script with them and directed it. And I asked the teacher, can we put it on for the school for the parents. I don't just want it to be an assembly because we've worked too hard. So can we have it 
I think she was a bit taken aback, but she agreed. And so they had a whole open production, you know, where people could, I don't know if they bought the tickets, but the, all adults came, the parents, all the kids. And I lived my dream. And I have no idea how good or bad it was and whether I could sing or not. I probably was terrible, but I was living it. I was literally somewhere over the rainbow and that was it. I think I felt like my destiny was was sealed to some extent in that moment. Wow, that is an incredible story, isn't it? So early on in your life as well. That was in your junior school, a school called Our Lady of Fatima in yeah. Birmingham. You then went on to secondary school, Lordswood Girls School. You didn't have such a good time of it. Did you truant? Did you bunk off school? Yeah, I mean, it was later. I mean, at first I, would, I tried to be good because obviously I didn't want to bring shame on my family and I definitely was a bit scared. And all girls' school, I mean, please, why were we sent there? I mean, my mum always says the best thing about going to school in Ladywood was the boys. And then she sends us to a girls' school. And I was just like, oh. But obviously I'd seen all the St. Trinian's films. So then I thought, hang on, it might not be as bad as it sounds. And there was a boys' school directly opposite over the field. So we spent a lot of our time just watching that school. <laughs> um, and for the first couple of years, I was okay. I didn't really like it. And I, I was unused to just girls. And I was a bit shy, I think. But in the third year, a production came along, The Importance of Being Earnest. And I was cast in it. Uh, surprisingly, the English teacher had seen something somehow, somewhere, and I was casting it. And that made me think school was going to be OK because I loved doing the play. But then they told me that was it. That was the only play. Then it was back to proper work and GC or O levels, you know, and CSEs and all of that. And I just thought, no, no, I, I just want to do plays. I don't want to do O levels. And I probably won't get them anyway because I was always dreaming and you know just I wasn't very academic I was good at English but I was terrible at maths the teacher who used to make me stand on the chair and do my two times table in front of everyone and humiliated me and when I went home and said I'm I'm no good at maths they said yeah you're really stupid why aren't you good at maths your sisters are brilliant and I was like oh I just don't, all I want to do is sing or dance or act and I was dancing outside of school because you know the story that I went on Tis Was, don't you? Another great Not Midland everybody show. here does. You went on <gasps> Tis Was, yeah. the great Tis Was show. And because I went on Tis Was, it was part of my dancing school, and we were auditioned by Lenny Henry and Chris Tarrant, and we were on the Saturday morning show. I just thought, oh, what do I need school for? I'm on my way. I'm on the telly. You know, I wasn't really thinking about <laughs> how I had to actually have a future and earn a living and all of that. So I stopped going to school. You know, when, when I was about 14, 15, I just didn't go. And I, I used to pretend I was going and I'd go to town or I'd go to my nan's or I'd go to the park. And it's actually quite interesting wasting days and days and days um, pretending you're somewhere that you're not and finding excuses and ways to hide that. And then, when, of course, when the truant officers turned up at my mum and dad's, they were like, what? <laughs> she hasn't been going to school. So then it was like, oh, let's sit her down. Let's find out what's going on. I just have to say, I just can't stand it. I don't like it. Like, I feel trapped and I'm not doing very well. Actually, I did sit my exam, so I had to go a bit and I got through it, but I couldn't wait to get out of there. <sighs> couldn't wait. <laughs> You clearly had this vision of your life in theatre, in performance. Is it true that you dreamt of the Juilliard Acting School in New York? When I left school at 16, I didn't know what I was going to do. I, I didn't have a plan. I knew I wasn't going to go to university. There was nothing on the horizon. So I just went and did a YTS scheme, a bit like an apprenticeship, but just for a year. And although I trumpeted from that as well and got into trouble because I turned up about twice a week instead of the five days, I did learn how to type, which was really brilliant later on in life. So I was always grateful for that, really. But yeah, my mum was absolutely in despair. And she just said, now we've had more calls about you not turning up where you're going to, what are you going to do with your life? Like the only thing you've ever wanted to do was be on the stage. So I found a place, I'm taking you to an audition next Saturday. 
And I said, what do you mean? She said, it's a drama school. And I was like, what's a drama school? So I started researching drama schools and I found the Juilliard in New York. And I was like, I'm going to New York. <laughs> I'm going to New York. I'm going to be an actor. And she said, you're going to Coventry. And I said, oh, I hadn't even heard of Coventry. She said, it's not far. It's only 30 minutes on the train. So that's where you're going if you're lucky enough to get in. <laughs> so she took me and... Yeah. The rest is history, as yeah. they say. Now, we ask all of our guests on this podcast series about a Midlands memory, and that's really the next bit in this story, isn't it? It's when you came to Coventry. It was um, an epiphany, and it was a life-changing experience for me. So Coventry already had captured my imagination and my heart because, A, I was out. I'd escaped. And I don't mean that I wanted to get away from Birmingham or from my family per se. I just knew I wanted to do something different and new. And I was on a trajectory somewhere. I was on a journey. It was the start of my yellow brick road. And I was so excited to be there. In fact, when I auditioned, I didn't know if I got in or not. And I just said to myself, if I don't get into that school, I'm going to kill myself. That's what I said to myself, and I actually meant it, I think. So when I did get into the school, I, I was like, this is it, this is my life now. And, and from that moment, I never doubted that this wouldn't be my life. I never did anything else, I never had to. I made that my life every day for the rest of my life. So Coventry School of Theatre then became Coventry Centre for Performing Arts, is now Coventry University, absolutely shaped and made and trained me in a brilliant way. They were absolutely amazing, inspiring. It's incredible hearing you say that, Debbie, because we tend to think that people outside the Midlands have a bit of a downer on us. But the picture you're painting is a place that's immensely creative and entrepreneurial. It, it was exactly that. And not only was it that, it was like a village from Birmingham. It, it, it felt like a village where everybody knew everybody and people were friendly and they reached out to each other and they helped each other. Everybody helped everybody. Everybody knew everybody. It was a friendly, warm, exciting, ambitious place to be. And judging from this year's City of Culture, it still very much is. How do we change that perception of the Midlands and of Coventry as being these places where not much goes on? Or should we just let them carry on in their happy ignorance? In all cities, in all towns, you know, there are, there are two sides. You know, there's the good side and there's the darker side. And if you let one side t get more attention, then that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So somewhere like you know, the ghost town of Coventry, violence, drugs, alcohol, nobody goes into the city centre, it's too frightening. You know, people start to believe that and um, it becomes true. Nobody will go into the city centre, everyone is too frightened. And it's not to say that those elements don't exist, of course they do, but they exist everywhere. What I think we need to do is we have to shine a light on the good stuff, because the good stuff is happening, it's happening all the time, everywhere, but we don't put, illuminate it. So we, we don't take pride in it or joy in it, we don't talk about it, spread the word, and we don't believe in it. From my point of view, it's absolutely a part of this city and a part of our region. And we have so much to shout about and so much to celebrate. I have to ask you the question, why, as somebody who'd come out of college as an actor, did you not follow the well-trodden path? to London, because that would have been the obvious place for you to go. Well, I, I'll be honest, I tried. We were all at the end of our diplomas, Coventry. We all bought the stage. We all went for the auditions. I mean, ah, oh, the auditions, you know, Greece, the cruise ship. I really wanted to go on the cruise ship. You know, I, <laughs> I went to audition for Greece. But what I really quickly realised was that the parts for women, young women, were usually really rubbish. You didn't know who you were auditioning for. You didn't know the quality of their work. You, you know, that you were going to be a passive kind of passenger of your own life. That's how I felt if you kept going down that route. Because I, did, I, I didn't really think I was just an actor. I wanted to make stuff. So I thought, 
yeah, this probably isn't for me. But I did get out of Coventry, and not because I really wanted to, but I got a job, and that was in Cambridge for the Cambridge Experimental Theatre Company. And let me tell you, if you don't already know, Cambridge is a long way from Coventry in every way. <laughs> Far from the vibrant, edgy, real art scene it's got the townies and the gownies and it was the gownies who i was with we've all got these you know women doctorates from cambridge speaking very intellectually about theater and me going oh my goodness i don't know what you're you know i didn't know what humus was you know that's the truth i didn't know what humus was i've had no sort of middle class existence at that point you know now obviously i i, I live a middle class life but then i didn't know what any of it was i put red wine in the fridge guys <laughs> you know all kinds of atrocities took place but i suppose the, th the thing was again you know it didn't take long to realize that there are a lot of imposters in that intellectual world just as much as we all feel a bit of imposter syndrome from time to time or that we don't belong or we shouldn't be allowed in i was very conscious that a lot of them were pontificating about stuff they knew very little about but they had the language so i was able to cut through a lot of that with them and they respected that and you know I did actually get myself into a good position with that company and it gave me the confidence then to set up my own company and there was no way I wanted to stay and do it in somewhere like Cambridge I wanted to come back here. So I just want to fast forward on that because uh, there was something that you said in relation to Nativity and how Nativity unlike a lot of successful movies and movie franchises isn't based around special effects. It isn't based around the world of what you can do effectively with a computer. It is about telling particularly children's stories, the children of Coventry and Birmingham and Wolverhampton and giving them a sense that their lives matter and their stories matter. And that's right. And, and unless somebody does that, how do they know they matter? And it's the same the way that many black people feel, which is why black lives matter. And how do you know you matter unless someone tells you you matter? You need that reassurance. You need that endorsement. So for me, it's a no brainer that I matter. You know, I was a, a, a little misfit. I wasn't conventional, but I mattered and they matter. And so the children of St. Bernadette's, for example, are just a bit of me and a bit of lots of kids that I've met in my life. Why shouldn't we make a film about them as opposed to a big, brilliant, you know, fantastical animation by, by Disney or, you know, whatever. That's fantastic. But sometimes children just want to see themselves. They want to be able to relate. Um, and that's all it is. And live action films, sadly, are, are really difficult to get made these days. I just wonder whether deciding to have a base in filmmaking in Coventry was a help or a hindrance because there was, as with the rest of the West Midlands, a pretty small film and TV production base around here. Yeah, I guess I was. But because I was new to film, in, in a way, I, I, I didn't know quite how to make it happen that where it felt like it might be safe was home you know home is where you feel safe and so I thought if I was going to have to start again which it felt like I was doing to a large extent retrain after 15 years running my own theatre company I was going to start again in a new art form really I thought I'd better try and do it at home where it was safe to build my confidence and make mistakes you say you weren't that well versed in, in the world of film at that point. You made a few short films before that. What, what are the benefits of shooting in a place like Coventry rather than in a more fashionable location? Well, I think that the only reason I actually know the answer to that is because I have shot a film in London and, and that film was Confetti. Yeah. Um, and it was very difficult, very, very challenging to shoot there because London is a big old, dirty old, busy old place, however fantastic it is. And to get anywhere takes you forever. So you are exhausted by the traveling and then frustrated by not having the time you need to shoot the scene because you've got to get to your next location, which is another hour and a half away because it's the other side of the river. And you just think, well, this is crazy. It's like shooting in different countries, really. Plus, you have Londoners, who, of course, many of my friends are Londoners, but they're not Midlanders, you know. They're not smiley, warm and welcoming. They're really, you know, in terms of what we need for locations, can we, can we use your hotel 
uh, yeah, if you want to pay this much money for it, you know, do you mind if we park here? Uh, I don't think so. That's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, it, it's very different. Here, people are very accommodating, very cooperative. I find very warm, very welcoming. Four films that I've shot out of this city, and it's been a joy. That's lovely to hear. Well. <laughs> And Confetti, the film that Debbie mentioned there, big hit, picked up for distribution by Fox Searchlight, who are a massive company. This led, Debbie, to you being courted by Brad Pitt. I hope to stress, not in a romantic sense, though. I'm, I'm not saying that would be out of the question, Debbie, but... <laughs> Go on, what's the story of Brad Pitt? Well, it was just, it was just that we went um, to you know, LA and to Toronto for the film festival and Confetti was like the new hot movie. And suddenly I, I was being, you know, courted by everyone, actually. I mean, I was posted from studio to studio. So I go and meet the head of Sony and then I go and he meet the head of Paramount, go and meet the head of, you know, Disney. And I had meaningful conversations with everyone. And then we did a screening in Toronto on a Sunday morning. And the film went down very well. And afterwards, a guy came up to me and he said, hi, I think my boss is going to love your movie. And I think he's going to love you. Because I'd done a little introduction and I'd made people laugh a little bit. And I said, oh, right. OK, who's your boss? It's just a guy called Brad Pitt. <laughs> I said, okay, yeah, when does he want to meet? Like, so <laughs> it, was, it was a couple of years talking about projects, developing projects that didn't actually come into fruition. And I think that's partly because it's a long process. If you go for the studio system there, it can take you four, seven, 17 years. And, you know, they don't do things quickly. Um, that was very frustrating for me. I want to make stuff. I don't want to develop stuff. I actually want to make it actually happen. So I didn't want to get locked into that system. And they wanted me to relocate. The studios and the American agent wanted me to relocate. And me and my partner had just had recently had our baby. Or she was, actually, she was probably about four then. And she was settling into school. And the idea of taking her and, and ourselves away from our roots, our safe place, our wonderful families and relocating to, to, to LA in order to do films that would make me rich, but not necessarily feed my soul, just felt like the wrong decision for me. I know I'm the kind of person that needs my soul fed. So I came back. <laughs> <laughs> so you quit. <laughs> You quit Hollywood for Coventry. Get it? I mean, it's, it's the magnet, isn't it, pulling you back? And you said, I wanted to create my own version of Hollywood on my own doorstep, which you have done with nativity names like David Tennant, Martin Freeman, Catherine Tate, Martin Clune. So, you know, you've really put Coventry on the map as a, as a film location, but you've, in the nicest possible sense, used Coventry, these fantastic locations like the Cathedral, the Holy Family School in Kersley, which is the real St. Bernadette's. And that's, uh, we can tell listening to you, that, that obviously means something to you. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I, I knew ever since my daughter went to school that watching those little children doing their plays, for me, their talent and their truthfulness, you know, was there for all to see. The idea of put, shining a light on that and putting it on a big screen was a no-brainer. You know, it was like, look what we have here. I've seen a lot of London stage school kids. I've seen a lot of American kids. There's nothing quite like a, a, an innocent, you know, someone who hasn't been trained or the, the thought of being in a film had never occurred to them or their parents that gives you something really special. That gives you authenticity. The music is written at home with you and your partner, Nikki. Yeah. The, the film editing is done at home yeah. with you and your partner, Nikki. Yeah. I mean, you know, at, at a house in Coventry, <laughs> well, this, it's glo funny. this globally successful film is and made. It, it is funny because, you know, we did have the call when we were doing confetti saying, you know, where can we land? Where are, you know, we're like, well, <laughs> to be honest, we haven't got a helicopter landing pad. We've got a tiny little garden and a little, and we actually had to welcome these American execs. I mean, proper power 
Hollywood studio people into our house in Coventry and um, get them to watch a cut of the film. And it was extraordinary. It was, it was hilarious. But we've done it with everyone. We've done it with the BBC execs. We've done it with, with movie studio execs here. A anyone who wants to see the cut of the film as we're going has to come to see it, you know. <laughs> and it means that everybody... Do, do I mean it's taken down a peg or two? I don't know. But what I mean is they have to become part of what we're doing. You know, they have to become part of our extended family. Because I see Coventry as my home now, much to my mum's chagrin. I have to admit, like, she's, you're a brummy. Your home's here in Birmingham. But, you know, it, 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 Coventry is my home and it has my heart. And, you know, when we make our films on set, if somebody says to me, oh, can my uncle come and have a look? Of course they can. Can. bring your uncle you know or my sister wants a part an extra can she be an extra absolutely or you know somebody on the crew says oh so and so's just had a baby will she be able to have a job of course she will have a baby i had a baby everyone has a baby it's fine <laughs> you know but just to take the sort of mystique out of it make it accessible to everybody who works on the films make it feel like a family which it is grow that family you know and and if you don't want to be part of our family do one. <laughs> <laughs>you given us your Midlands memory, which is arriving in Coventry, going down the Yellow Brick Road or the A45, as it's sometimes known, <laughs> and discovering this place. Your Midlands hero. I, I have to say my dad, because he was such a Peaky Blinder, and um, he opened the first video shop, actually, in Birmingham um, when I was a, a, a teenager in the 1980s. And I do think sometimes without that video shop, I wouldn't have had my own very personal film school, because I didn't go to film school, but I watched every single film that was ever made during you know my 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 time with dad at the video shop um so he, he he was a hero for so many reasons you know he was a good he was bad he was naughty he was nice he was real <laughs> he was hard working and he was entrepreneurial and he taught me how to be entrepreneurial he had many 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 different jobs different businesses uh, some of them lasted a week some of them lasted three years but he would turn his hand to anything because he was absolutely fearless and i think that's the thing that's why he's my hero he was fearless nobody could stop my dad from doing anything and if i got one trait from him i think it's that <laughs> <laughs> what is your midlands masterpiece this can be a place or a thing something of the midlands that you know it's, de it's definitely the cathedral ruins for me it, coventry here, coventry yeah. coventry cathedral ruins is the most magical place it, it it's everything it stands for peace and reconciliation Everything you feel when you stand there, the, the loss, you know, the, the, the grief, the, the shock of something so obviously beautiful in its origin, um, still beautiful, perhaps more beautiful in its ruins, um, still standing, surviving. And not only surviving, just surviving, but, but living and breathing and attracting new people. Coventry Cathedral Ruins was blitzed, but it offers hope and it's not going anywhere it's gonna have a future that's amazing to me brilliant and your midlands manifesto the one thing the midlands needs to do to up its already impressive game well because i am such a fan of our region and the whole of the region not just coventry but i think we have amazing beautiful warwickshire countryside we have amazing history my goodness you know, William Shakespeare was born and bred in the Midlands. Like, what do we what do we need to say about it? But we don't say enough about it. So for me, it is that that continued idea of shining a light and celebrating what we have, what we had, who we are, and where we're going. I mean, I love to think that film and television could play a great part in that, which is why you know I'm an advocate for for opening more training, more accessible training for, for that career. Because for, for me, those working class kids in schools like me who weren't particularly academic would never have given a moment's thought to being able to work in the film industry. But 
do you know, everybody can work in the film industry. Anybody can work in the film industry. You're like, if you good at woodwork you can work in the film industry in the carpentry you know if you're good at driving you can drive the stars there's something for everybody in this industry it is not an exclusive industry it's desperately in need of passionate people not degrees not with degrees we don't need degrees this is and nothing against degrees but this is an industry that really doesn't care about degrees you never ask anyone in our industry did you get a degree <laughs> you'd never so if you you are working class and you are lost and you want to live a life of passion and possibility and hardship at times, you know, come and work in our industry. But we don't want to lose you to London and L.A. So we need to create an industry here. And, you know, this is the small beginnings of it. Let's go for it. Made in the Midlands is an original idea by Andrew Smith, who is also the producer. The researcher is Molly Davidson and the executive producer is Richard Berry. Sound design is by Dan King and the music is composed by Maya Miller-Lewis. That's me. We're all from the Midlands, like our host, Adrian Goldberg. Ladies and gentlemen, Debbie Isaac, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. In the next edition of Made in the Midlands, the frontman of Coventry indie band The Enemy, Tom Clark, tells us about his love of cars. You've got Enzo Ferrari winning Le Mans and winning Formula One, dominating motorsports from Modena in Italy. And a bloke in Coventry designs the Jaguar e and Enzo Ferrari looks at it and says it's the most beautiful car ever made. You know, that thing was made in Coventry. And my granddad put the chrome on it. Why not subscribe to Made in the Midlands wherever you get your podcasts to hear from Tom and a host of other famous Midlanders. We'd also love to know about your own Midlands heroes. Email us at madeinthemidlands at loftusmedia.co.uk do share the podcast with anyone you think might enjoy it and please leave us a review as well it all helps to get us noticed made in the midlands is an original commission by the coventry uk city of culture 2021 proudly produced by loftus media thanks for listening ta-da